operation of clusters within a dimensionally reduced space. Um, but it doesn't actually eliminate those genes from further downstream analysis. And it's not going to um, change the number of cells that we're looking at at all. It's, we're still going to be looking at all of the, in this case, I would choose to look at these 4,625 cells that I didn't have as, and I'm putting it in air quotes here, quality cells. Now you might choose not to use that quality control gate or use a different quality control gate. Uh, but that's the only time that I'm eliminating cells. Uh, and we are going to not focus on the other 100 cells that I, that I eliminated there. But in now, terms of... But now, that's highly dispersed genes, right. you know, are the, are the genes I can see. So uh, those are genes that lots of cells... Uh, that I mean, they're differentially expressed in different cells, but then, or, then you're okay. You're not eliminating, you're not eliminating cells, but aren't you eliminating a lot of genes? You're only selecting the ones that are different. Uh, yeah, it's it is. A lot of people ask about that, whether or not we're removing the genes, but we're actually not. We're only identifying a subset of genes that we're going to use for the first couple of steps in terms of. Um, Dimensionality reduction in clusters. Oh, I see. Yeah. But then, as as we dig into the clusters, we'll look at all of the genes. See, I'm just thinking. Oh, I see. Because if it's expressed in all cells, it's not going to help define a cluster. Yeah. Okay. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And we can go back to it and say, okay, that's another one. Because we do notice that, and somewhere along the line, when you try to look at this gene, but uh, and you see it where it is, it's in all the cells. But but you, so that's not used for the class. I wonder why it doesn't do that automatically. Like I think uh, that other program loop. You know, it, it kind of guess it does it automatically, and it shows you the genes that define the cluster. You know, it gives you a list, and you know, like the top twenty. You know what I mean? The top one is is sort of like in one cluster. That's that defined the cluster. In other words, in other words, it, for clustering. Yeah. I mean, right. You know what I mean? Which which genes define the cluster? I mean, it knows, you know, it knows if it wants to find a cluster, what genes are different. It can do it. We don't have to tell it, you know, right? Okay, we do. Um, yeah, so what, sorry, I didn't catch what platform is giving you that list of genes? The loop. Loop, oh, yes. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think how exactly we would show the same type of information. I know a lot of different softwares um, do some kind of filtering based on the same kind of uh, parameters, um, and perhaps that's how it's getting to that list of genes. Uh, but certainly, if you have a couple of populations of interest, then we can do something like um, differential expression analysis, and mm -hmm. that'll give you a list of genes. I mean, on loop, you say, you touch, you know, you see these populations, and you t touch on this population, and then it gives you, well, it gives you at the bottom, like the, um, what is it, the clusters, cluster one, two, three, four, five, six, that kind of thing. Touch on cluster one, it gives you like the top gene that defined that cluster, and then you go down, and then cluster two, you know, so forth, like that. So, yeah, so we, yeah, one, as soon as we get to clustering, we could do something similar. Okay. Um, and actually, I mean, we have two clusters here, like 165 versus 166. Okay, so if I wanted to do, um, I've just calculated my principal components, but if I wanted to ask what genes define 165 versus 166, I could go to the gene group and then compare uh, 166 versus 165, and then do differential expression analysis. And here's where I would start to ask, okay, these are like the top two genes that are defining. Um, this will be up in 165, B166. And then whenever you gate in gene, you get a new gene set back here. So if I open that up, you can see that those are the five, the five genes that are most highly, you know, upregulated in cluster one or so I should say in sample 165 relative to 166. So lysozyme. Uh, that's, uh, I think maybe that's because the macrophage. Right, the macrophage. ones probably got contaminated or something. Right. We're not too, what's that bottom one? H, I can't read it, but H. HBB. Right? 
HBB. HBV. Uh, yeah. Um, H is in uh, help. Is in boy. B is in boy. So, right. So Ian, uh, uh, it, can we run it like a blow? So we gate down, let's say B cell first, and then compare the difference. Yeah. So you're asking if we could do, do like canonical gating similar to flow. Right. Right. Because that one, it sounds like lysozyme. The one cluster is contaminated with macrophages, or I mean the one patient, and you know, so they're, you know, that's defining. That's a defining thing, but we don't want that to be the defining thing. We, we haven't got to the point where we're defining unbiased clusters um, based on the expression of genes, but that's a, around the time where I would start to want to do like gene set enrichment analysis, try and define uh, phenotypes within the data. Mm. Uh, however, some people will want to be meaning similar to flow on individual genes associated with certain, you know, canonical markers. Mm. So we could try that out here. One really common one would be like CD3E, the Epsilon chain of the CD3 uh, surface property, right? And these should be able to tell us roughly where we expect to find T cells. Right. So something like a log axis probably. And then if we were curious about B cells, probably CD19 would be uh, the one I would use. Again, this probably isn't the way we would recommend doing um, cluster identity identification flow. Let's see if I have anything in here. So this uh, PD3 minus PD19 positive, those are probably our B cells. Are they in that plot? I didn't see in there. They're in the plot. Um, because everything's smashed on the axis here, it looks a little bit funny. Let me try and clear that up a little bit. The large dots will help. I can also change axis, customize the axis, and maybe make like an arc singe axis. Okay. And then similarly for this axis. You know, when you do it, you touch CD3 Epsilon. Right, you touch yep. the axis, and that's how, because I tried some of this, and sometimes it doesn't switch, and I don't know, I actually don't know, you know, what to do to turn the program on, like CD, I touch this axis, and then what happened, like, can you go through that, just like for CD3 Epsilon, you, you can touch that, turn that on, right, can you do that a little slower, you touch CD3 sure. Epsilon, and then what's, what's, is that what you're doing, uh, is it on? See, see if I got this right. Um, you guys are just to let you know, um, you're a little bit hard to hear. It's uh, coming in a little bit um, choppy, so I apologize if I uh, haven't written these stuff. But I think I think what you asked is how do I bring these events off of the axis? Well, no, I was just saying in general. You know, you've got an axis. You've got two axes, and I just don't know how to manipulate these axes. So, for example. If you go to CD3 Epsilon, what choices do you have to make the axis look, or the, the, the dots or plot look like what you want? Uh, yeah, so to, for CD3, we're talking about the yeah. X axis in the case. If you click on this T button. Oh, the T button, the right. Scale, and that's the default. Okay. You can also look at log. Log shift just moves everything up by a unit. Um, and then log inverse is not used very often, except maybe for the uh, p values in a volcano plot. So I tend to avoid that one for the most part. And then you also have this customized axis right. function, right? Okay. Yeah. Which actually gives you a lot more fine tuning control. Um, and in there, you can change the transform to look at something like a, a mixed modal uh, axis. So arc sins, for example, has a little bit of space around zero that's linear. And then the rest of the axis you'll notice is uh, roughly a log scale. Uh, that's similar to with like uh, uh, hyperlog and logical and bi-exponential. Those all have a little bit of linear space and log for the rest of the axis. Okay. 
So you customize the axis. All right, I'll look into that. I try, you know, sometimes I want to make it look different. I don't really know what to do, so I, yeah. I you know, I play around with it, but I'll play more. And that's sometimes the best thing. I, I'm often playing around with the axes. If you get stuck at any point, you know, don't hesitate. Just send me an email. We'll uh, we can troubleshoot later. Okay. So I won't I won't change that one. I'm okay with this. If anything, I might consider bringing this down a little bit more, like uh, maybe around there. Because if you're only expressing one of these uh, transcripts, you might still consider that within the negative bounds. Um, or I might just leave that up to the researcher to decide exactly now, what they consider. Now this is uh, this is cell cell view, right? So each of those dots is a cell. At least one cell. You'll notice there's a red dot at zero at the origin, uh -huh. and that's many cells. So you mean because I know there's a lot of B cells. Uh, there are a lot of B cells. It looks like uh, 2,600. Right. But on the CD19 positive CD F, CD3 epsilon negative, you know, there's it says I see looking at quadrant is 50. 6.7 percent how do you know how do you know how many you know like a distribution or something like that of gene distribution uh, we would have to get into it to figure out the the gene distributions we haven't yet looked kind of at the genes associated with these cells um, but one option would be to look at um, a differential expression analysis of B cells versus the rest of the data, mm -hmm. and then we can pull out the genes that are upregulated in B cells. So, I mean, the thing I guess I'm wondering is, uh, like, it's little dots, but each dot, is that like how many times it was counted? For example, 10 to the 1 is, say, 10. So the, the little blue dots on top were counted 10, is 10 cells that had, or no, yeah, no, the 10 cells that had CD3, uh, CD19 in them? Is that what it means? Uh, no. no, you said it right in the, when you first said that we're looking at cell view, so each dot is at least one event, that meaning at least one cell. Right. In terms of expression, um, these are probably, I'm thinking these are reads per cell. Uh, so along the x-axis, you'll see we have a zero value. Mm -hmm. So for most of these cells, we have no expression of CD3, um, but as we move on to the tick mark here, this means one expression, uh, one transcript was detected, right? So probably, and it depends a little bit on the normalization. Like some people will use TPM or FPKM, but a lot of times in this single cell RNA, stuff, it's per transcript, uh, transcript per cell. So here, one transcript was detected you know, for CD3E, looking just right up this set of bins. I mean, really, this is a histogram, right? Uh, right. A two histogram. I got to get used to this, but uh, but the thing is, is what is the dot? What is the dot? Uh, the top blue dot mean on the C CD19 axis? The one over the CD19, oh. one of those. What is, does that mean? There's 10, 10 cells, or no, ten transcripts, and how many cells? I don't know. Well, it's difficult to say just from this view. I mean, I can see that there's two dots here. Right. Those might represent more than one cell, but if I want to double check, I could draw a gate here, kind of just question what is this? And we'll see that there's actually 26 cells inside that gate. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small percentage, um, but there are a couple of cells there. I mean, more than a couple, 26. Right. Well, since they're mostly B cells, right? The best. right. So you, I just wonder, you know, how, why are they mostly B cells? But you know, from this view, it looks like there's a lot of T cells. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like CD3. You know what I mean? It just. Right. I, I mean, I see the five point nine nine five point nine five percent, which is. Which is two hundred seventy five. Two seventy five. And what about the B? Oh, I see. How did you get to this view? So this is just back in the workspace. Every population you define becomes a subset or a indented kind of hierarchy oh, I see. with this um, sample. Oh, okay. So, right, that would be good. To, how do you 
you know, sometimes I get these things and I don't see, <laughs> I don't see this. So does this just pop up automatically or do you have to touch yeah. something to get every, this? Every time you draw a gate, it's uh, going to create either a population here in this, if it's in cell view, if it's in gene view, it's going to appear here at the top as a gene set. Oh, I see. Yeah, that this uh, is... This is something very fundamental, Ian, that I, that I kind of had. There's three compartments here. There's right. a top compartment, and the middle compartment, and the bottom compartment. I kind of get those mixed up. Okay. But so, it, um, yeah. the top set is going to be always gene sets. Okay. And one way you can kind of, you know, remind yourself if you ever get lost in this, if you double-click on a gene set, you'll get this gene set inspector.